Okay, thank you everybody for attending our first outreach event of the year in support of Undergraduate Research Week. This is our first panel uh, discussion uh, with faculty um, to talk about undergraduate research in chemistry. So I will throw it to our two moderators, Olivia Matsumoto Elliott and Rima Baez. All right, thanks, Perry. Uh, so I'm Olivia. I'm a third year chemistry student here and I'm also an undergraduate ambassador. So I'll be asking the questions for this panel. Uh, Rima's going to keep an eye on the chat and write down any questions you ask there. But while we're doing the panel, please keep your microphones off. Feel free to show your beautiful faces. We'd love to see people and, you know, not just talking to the abyss. So thank you for everyone who has their camera on. Uh, and I guess we should start with Rima. Would you also like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Rima. Um, I'm a second year pharmaceutical chemistry major, um, and I'll be answering um, any questions I can answer in the chat. And if I don't have the answers, we can come to those at the end. Okay. All right. Awesome. All right. So I guess without further ado, let's have our panelists please introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Kyle Crabtree. Well, hi everyone. I'm a, uh, I'm Kyle Crabtree. I've been a professor here at UC Davis uh, since 2014. Um, I teach undergraduate physical chemistry classes, uh, Chemistry 110B, and uh, this spring I'll be teaching a scientific programming with Python class. And uh, my group studies astrochemistry, doing a lot of um, experimental spectroscopy and uh, theoretical calculations. Was there anything else you wanted me to uh, to cover in my introduction? No, you had everything. It was just name, lab, research topic, and then common classes that you teach at Davis. So you you hit it all <laughs> without me asking. Which sorry. Uh, let's have Dr. Franz introduce herself next. Hi everyone. I'm Annalisa Franz. I'm a professor here in the Department of Chemistry, and I'm also faculty director for the Undergraduate uh, Research Center. So check out some of the other events going on this week as well. Um, the research in my lab primarily involves organic synthesis, but especially using catalysts to accelerate the rate and promote specific selectivity that we're interested in. We also do some mechanistic studies, um, and then we also look at especially bioactive molecules and their properties. Um, the classes I normally teach are organic chemistry, like 8 and 128, and also advanced spectroscopy, which is a graduate level course, um, 219. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let's have Dr. Bourbon go next, please. Hey everyone, um, my name is Louise Bourbon, and I study inorganic chemistry, mostly for my research. Um, and we study inorganic chemistry and its applications in renewable energy and energy storage. So a lot of focus on redox chemistry, since it's storing electrons in, in chemical bonds is the type of chemistry that you need to do renewable energy. And the common classes that I teach are inorganic chemistry. In the spring, I most often teach 124C, which is the upper division undergraduate class. And I often teach a, a graduate course as well that's a kind of like the graduate version of 124c sometimes there's a couple undergraduates in that class that's k 226. all right thank you um let's have dr sheila david go next myself so hi everyone my name is sheila david and um, i have been a professor here at uc davis for since 2000 Six. Wow. Um, and I, but I have been a professor longer than that because I was at the University of Utah for 10 years before that. And I was also at UC Santa Cruz before that. So um, had a lot of undergrads. I was actually counting it up for something I needed to, to do. I've had like over uh, 60 or 70 undergrads. It was like an incredibly large number. <laughs> um, so um, lots of undergrads have worked in the lab over the years. So I think of myself as a chemical biologist um, and I'm interested in DNA uh, repair. So we use a variety of approaches to understand how enzymes repair uh, damage to DNA and uh, the relevance to cancer. 
And so that's, um, in terms of teaching, I teach the undergrad pharmaceutical chemistry class. Um, so it's the Chem 130A. And I've also taught the 135, um, the, the, the lab, the chemical, the bioorganic lab that's associated with the farm chem. I um, am also teaching the Introduction to Chemical Biology, which is a graduate level class that a lot of undergrads actually take that class, so you should look into that. Um, but I have, over my lifetime as a faculty member, taught inorganic chemistry, biochemistry, organic chemistry. Um, so I have actually taught a lot of different classes, and so that's one of the reasons I really like the Farm Chem series, because you can bring in a lot of different topics um, all focused um, on drugs so all right thank you yeah. and then dr heifer <laughs> professor david makes me feel really unexperienced um, <laughs> I, <laughs> so my name is marie heifer and i've been a professor here at uc davis since 2017 um, i typically teach 124a uh, which is the inorganic chemistry for the first class of the that upper division series, um, and I've taught 228A, which is a grad level course. Some other some undergrads have enrolled it in its bio inorganic chemistry, um, and that leads into my research topic. My lab uh, has research that centers around inorganic chemistry as it's applied to biological systems, and in particular, the role that metals play in health and metabolic diseases, including diabetes, obesity related disorders, um, as well as uh, some dabbling a little bit in cancer and some molecular imaging as well. Um, but the lab consists of some inorganic chemistry as well as um, doing things from cell culture models all the way to the animal models. All right, thanks so much. Uh, next we'll have Kelly Meyer introduce herself. Hey everyone, um, I'm Kelly. I'm actually a grad student. I'm going into my fourth year here. I work in Dr. Crabtree's lab, so doing astrochemistry. And I guess I can speak specifically towards entering grad school a little older. I was 30 when I entered grad school. I kind of changed careers, so if, if any of you are in that similar boat, I can, can talk to you about how my path was. And I've also under, um, mentored a few undergraduates during my time here, so it's, it's really been, been great. So can speak to both those avenues, not necessarily teaching, um, you know, hardcore classes, but as a TA, you definitely TA, right? So, um, you know, you're, you're doing gen chem, physical chemistry for me, I wouldn't touch organic chemistry. Um, so you get to do a variety of, of TAing, um, most likely. All right, awesome. And then last but not least, Ellen Chu. Hi everyone, um, my name is Ellen Chu. Uh, I recently just graduated from UC Davis, class of 2020. Um, so I'm fresh, I guess, closer to everyone um, with this upcoming year. It's kind of weird with COVID, but hopefully everyone's staying safe. Um, and I majored in pharmaceutical chemistry, and I had the opportunity to actually do undergraduate research with Professor Sheila David, who is in um, the room today. And as she said, um, I worked on the chemical synthesis side of her research lab, where I focused on understanding the stereochemistry and identifying the importance of the two amino position um, in damaged DNA and how our body has enzymes to cleave that and identify that. So um, I recently just graduated, as I said before, and I'm currently working. So let me know if you have any questions about, you know, student life or the classes and everything. I've gone through, I guess, majority of the chemistry classes, and I can give you a student perspective on everything. All right, awesome. Thanks so much, everyone, for introducing yourselves. Uh, before we get too heavily into it, I just wanted to start it off with a bit of an icebreaker because I want this to be more of a, a casual conversation between everyone who's here and the panelists. So what has been everyone's favorite quarantine activity recently? For me, it's been painting. So whoever would like to chime in on what they've been doing recently to sort of fill the time or like get outside. Sheila, you're unmuted. I'm assuming that you're gonna. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I couldn't think of anything. What have I been oh. doing? I, I, I'll, I'll, uh, I, 
I've um, gotten really into gardening, um, but then beyond the gardening, I've been doing a lot of landscaping um, and landscaping our, our whole front yard and backyard. So um, that's kept me outside and away from a computer screen. I'm seeing a lot of uh, answers in the comments too about painting or they're doing Inktober, uh, a lot of reading, which is awesome. Reading those textbooks now too. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I've been trying to organize all my kids' things because they're going to be going to college soon. So, like, organizing all of their pictures and their, like, I have, like, piles and piles of all of the, everything that they've ever drawn, probably, in their eight, you know, 16, 17, 18 years that they've been um, drawing. So, <laughs> I've been, that's been my, my COVID project, is to organize, like, little books for them and things so oh, that's so cute yeah. <laughs> yeah okay if none of our other panelists have oh. uh i've been hiking a bit and, and gardening uh and some cooking and you know i guess nothing too unusual but outside <laughs> whatever possible <laughs> Oh, and for our panels, you don't have to keep uh, muting and unmuting yourselves. You can leave yourselves unmuted if you'd like. Uh, feel free to chime in whenever uh, something catches your eye or you want to say something. Uh, so I guess let's get into the, the heavy duty questions now. Um, in your opinion, why should undergrads get involved in research? And we'll start off with Dr. Franz. Well, as the faculty director of the undergrad, Graduate Research Center. Um, I have a whole list normally on slides. Um, there are so many reasons, um, but I'm going to just try to highlight a few, and then I know my colleagues will also chime in. Um, I really think it's one of the best ways to build your network and become connected with faculty and professionals, way more so than classes or internships. Um, and once you have that network, you're really going to be able to go to conferences, publish papers, do presentations, things that also translate into um, metrics and opportunities where you discover things for yourself, as well as discover things about the research that you're doing. Um, and so it's kind of a holistic sense of success rather than just looking at a GPA. There's a lot of students that are amazing in research and publish papers, even if their GPA you know, isn't straight A's because they are approaching things very differently. Um, the second thing is technical skills um, that are translatable, whether you wanna to go to grad school, whether you wanna do an internship, whether you wanna to go to a career in industry, um, and communication skills. So the skills that happen both inside the lab and outside the lab. Um, and finally, it's really fun. You're gonna meet people that you have a lot in common with. I am still friends with people I did research with as an undergrad, or I'm friends with undergrads who did research when I was a graduate student. Um, many of them were bridesmaids at my wedding. Like that's the level of friendship we're talking about. Out. Um, so you really become part of a team you know there's different events I know Louise's group also goes hiking sometimes as a group um, my my group we used to we don't do it anymore we used to do a lot of paintball uh, tournaments and things so there's a lot of fun opportunities and sometimes that doesn't get emphasized when we're busy telling you all the strategic reasons um, anyway so hopefully that covers a few bases and I'm happy to uh, provide more to this question but I know my colleagues will also have some great answers All right, I know I picked on Dr. Franz specifically, but uh, anyone else, feel free to chime in. I don't want to, you know, name names too much. <laughs> well, I think that what Annalisa was saying about have fun, it's, you know, I think it's a great support network and feeling like you're part of something and that you're part of UC Davis and part of the community. And so, um, you know, there's all these practical things, but I think also in terms of your success at UC Davis, um, I. I think being part of a research group really will give you a home. Um, actually, Ellen was in my lab, and I think that, you know, when, she, you know, sometimes um, undergrad can be hard, and, you know, having, having that support network of the lab that you feel like these are people that are there for you, the grad students and the other undergrads, and then me, you know, also, we're all like kind of a little family, so. I completely agree. I definitely felt very welcomed in Professor Sheila David's lab. Um, and it did make a huge impact on my undergraduate career. 
just because um, not only did I get the mentorship and learning experience that I was seeking out as an undergrad, but I also felt a sense of community within the lab. And, you know, all the events that happened with like, I got to meet graduate students, um, I got to develop a um, I guess, closer relationship with Professor David. So I think that it was a great learning opportunity for me. And it kind of, I guess, gave me a challenge to, you know, get out of my comfort zone and talk to people that, um, let's say graduate students or like pr professors in a sense. Um, it allowed me the opportunity to kind of, um, I guess, branch out and meet people and, you know, as Annalise uh, Fran said, um, that, you know, you get that network. Um, so I think that really made an everlasting impression. And research has not only provided me the practical skills and the workforce, because I'm currently working, and the experiences I've learned from undergraduate research strongly apply to my career right now. Um, I'm using a lot of HPLC and running a lot of assays and, you know, through Professor Sheila David's lab, like that's that's what I kind of learned from her lab. I did, I learned it from class, but I got to gain more hands-on experience through undergraduate research. I think you also get to see just how big and broad the field of chemistry really is. Like in, in your classes that you take as an undergrad, we're really just scratching the surface of so many different types of uh, chemistry that you encounter. But when you get to do undergraduate research, um, you not only get to develop technical skills, including a lot of skills that we don't get a chance to teach you in class, but you also get to dive in uh, and, and see one area of chemistry at a much deeper level and gain appreciation for how you know, your area of chemistry may connect to other areas um, and, and really seeing the interdisciplinary opportunities between chemistry and other fields is uh, another really exciting thing that can uh, uh, make you graduate with a broader perspective than you would otherwise have. I think there's been a lot of really good answers um, already, but I would say the skills that you learn are definitely not specific to chemistry, although they are specific to chemistry, even if you're ultimate and not to be a chemistry researcher, you, know, you really learn to do problem solving and you really learn to like stick with something over a long term and like see it through. It's not working for a while and then you, you, know, you keep trying and it works. Um, and so you learn this for yourself, but you also demonstrate that you can do this um, for future employers. Um, and so it's a really valuable kind of general experience, even if you don't think you'll be a chemistry researcher ultimately. Yeah, I'll add one last thing to that. Um, so uh, if you haven't seen Professor Franz put a whole list in the chat of reasons, um, <laughs> I'm gonna expand on one of those that has been hinted by everyone, but um, something that I personally experienced was I was not necessarily, I had test anxiety as an undergrad, and so test taking was really hard for me. Um, and undergrad research really helped me see that I had skills in other ways that may not be assessed in the traditional ways that classes are. And so I think that one benefit that you can really have with an undergrad research experience is that you start to learn a lot about yourself and the things that you're capable of doing. Um, and it may not fit the traditional picture of a class or a test. Um, so you know, and people around you with a support system can help you recognize that. Uh, and, um, you know, like I said, you, you for me, um, being able to be encouraged to pursue creativity in science was, was really exciting. So um, that's something else to consider. All right, thank you so much, everyone, for answering that question. Uh, we're gonna move on to the next one. Uh, so were you personally involved in undergraduate research uh, is it the same thing that you're currently researching or did you sort of have a switch in interests? And let's start with Kelly. Yeah, so I, because I decided to change careers a little later in life, um, I went back to a community college to take all of your STEM courses, which didn't have a research program, right? Um, so I actually tapped into the um, REU program, Research for Undergraduates, and uh, actually got an RU at UC Davis and uh, working in inorganic chemistry. And, you know, what's interesting is I think internships and, and experience can also tell you what you 
don't want to do. <laughs> and uh, that was inorganic chemistry for me. Uh, it ultimately, you know, I did not, you know, I thought I did because I, I took your tech, your classes in it and I, I, I thought I was interested in it. But ultimately that was not for me. Um, but I found that, you know, actually being in the lab working um, and ultimately physical chemistry was where kind of my passion slide. So, uh, so I would definitely, definitely, if you're, you know, you want to develop the skills that you're not getting in those uh, traditional classrooms, try to get experience, um, whether it's an REU or which takes you to a different campus perhaps, or it's in-house at UC Davis, uh, you really can't replicate, like no one can tell you what research is until you're actually experiencing it. So, um, so definitely try to get into those labs as, as soon as possible if you're actually really interested in it. All right, can we have one of our uh, professors answer as well? I can chime in. Um, I, uh, so I'll tell you a little bit of the story behind this, which I wanted to go into forensic science. So I decided pretty late in my um, undergrad career that I was gonna do research because my academic advisor told me I should do research so I can be get into a PhD program um, and uh, be competitive. And I didn't really know what research was or what it meant. Um, so I didn't start research until uh, the November of my senior year. Um, and I went, there was someone I wanted to work for who was a bioinorganic chemist and she left. Um, and she said, just do research in anything. It doesn't matter what, just get experience. Um, and so I went to the office that she used to sit at and there was a new professor there. I had no idea what he did. And I asked if I could do research in his lab in whatever he was doing, and it was making perovskite nanocrystals. Um, so that is more solid state chemistry applied to problems in um, like jet fuel. Um, and uh, we were wor working with the Air Force. It was pretty different. It's still inorganic chemistry, but it was solid state, um, still collaborative and interdisciplinary in many senses. Um, and then I ended up opting to stay an extra year. Um, so I picked up another major just so I could get financial aid to do a fifth year in undergrad so I could do more research. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say, put that plug in because not everyone starts their freshman year. Um, but, um, and I completely shifted fields. I knew I wanted to do something with metals because unlike Kelly, I love inorganic chemistry. Um, and I, um, I wanted to gain experience in something related to inorganic chemistry if possible. Um, but when I went to grad school, um, I had never taken a biology class. And so I took my first biochem class when I was in grad school. Um, and that kind of set me on the path to, to do the research that I'm doing now. I got my start in uh, doing organic chemistry. I started doing it after I took sophomore organic. I joined the lab of my organic chemistry professor because he was a really good professor. I did well in the class, so I did organic chemistry for about two years. And I realized that the parts that I enjoyed most about the research was everything except actually mixing chemicals in the lab and running columns and doing extractions and those kinds of things. I liked when I got to take my samples to the NMR or the HPLC or the UV biz. So I enjoyed the instrumental analysis part of the work. And so when I went to grad school, I decided that I wanted to learn how to build instruments. And this astrochemistry lab was building really big laser spectrometers and I had no idea how any of it worked, but I thought that that was something that sounded like a lot of fun to learn. And so I just kind of walked in and I was like, hey, can I, can I do this? I have no experience. And they were like, sure. And now I'm still doing astrochemistry and uh, building instruments. So I, I'm very far away from the organic chemistry where I started out. I'll jump in with my related story. I did do research in two different labs. Initially, I took a biochemistry class and I just thought biochemistry was the most, the most amazing thing ever until I realized it was amazing because of all the organic mechanisms because it was taught by an organic chemist. <laughs> and actually, when I did research in a biochemistry lab, I realized why well, I loved the applications. The day-to-day -day research in biochemistry didn't quite fit what I wanted to be doing. Um, and so then I also started research with someone who was mixing chemicals, synthesizing molecules, and thinking about catalysts. 
And uh, despite one traumatic day when I remember trying to scrape up like rhodium catalyst that I had spilled on the ground <laughs> because I'd been told how precious it was, um, I was still enamored with that idea. Um, and so I stayed in the area of synthesis and catalysis and that's where I still am today. But having that experience that's a little different than what you expect can be really, really valuable as well. I still learned a lot of translatable skills though. Yeah, so as you can see, you're not necessarily gonna start where you end. You might start in organic chemistry and then decide you like inorganic more. Uh, the point being just starting somewhere, like don't be afraid to start researching or start reaching out. You never know where you're gonna end up. Yeah, I, 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 maybe I'll just chime in quickly that, that I was like one, a classic pre-med and, um, and I went to a small college, St. Olaf College, and actually I had a hard time finding people that would take me into their lab because a lot of professors didn't want to have the pre-med in their lab. Um, but this one inorganic professor, and I actually loved his class too, I liked inorganic, um, said he would, t he would take me for the summer. So between my um, junior and senior year, I stayed at the summer in Northfield, Minnesota, so I could do undergrad research and then I continued when I was a senior, but it was organometallic chemistry, um, like osmium compounds, um, we all in the glove box, flammable ligands, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, and I liked doing that, it was fun, but I think ultimately my interest in biology and in organic chemistry drew me to do um, sort of bio inorganic later. So, um, so anyway, so sometimes you don't really, and then I decided after that whole experience, I decided I didn't want to go to medical school after all, because I realized that what I liked was the science of medicine, but not actually the idea of doing medicine. <laughs> um, and so um, I realized by getting a PhD, I could do the science part without, you know, a lot of the the yiki, the, I know it's very important, obviously in COVID, all these doctors, we need them very much, but uh, it just wasn't for me. So. Yeah, and I think <laughs> a point that we sort of touched on earlier, but maybe like went past a bit was that you don't necessarily have to do research at Davis. It's always good if you can do it at Davis, but there are other opportunities out there to get research either at other institutions or through internships. So just know that you're not limited to just the chemistry department or just Davis. There's other opportunities you can find out there. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to move on to the lucky. next question. Oh, you guys are ahead. lucky that this is such a big campus, that there's so many opportunities in this whole campus. So you don't have to just look in the chemistry department. I mean, you really can look. There's people all over this campus that would that's interesting research and just getting some experience. Like I think somebody said this earlier that you don't have to any type of even the research experience that I did in organometallics, you might think, oh, what is that? That helps me a lot even now because I learned some really important skills like, you know, using a schlank line, doing things anaerobically, you know, um, you know, working in a glove box. And those those are useful skills. So anyway, so you just you just just get some experience and don't worry about whether it's ultimately going to be you, you, know, you don't have to be doing it forever, right? So. All right, thank you. <laughs> and then we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, how has research changed for you and your lab since the start of COVID? And let's start off with Dr. Bourbon. Yeah, um, I think the, the biggest thing is probably how the graduate students need to change their time. We used to be able to come into work whenever we felt like it, um, although I certainly always encourage my students to spend a chunk of their time there in the middle of the day so they overlap with the other students. You know, sometimes you have some night owls, they don't want to come in until 2 p.m. And, and work all night, and I would always encourage them to come in at you know, 10 or 11 because you learn a lot from your lab mates in graduate school. Um, nothing you're doing is in the textbook. But now we kind of have to schedule everything in advance and kind of plan out when I'm going to work in lab. This is the stuff I can do at home, um, which I think um, in some ways has been good kind of time management training for students as well, even though 
it would be nice to have the old way of, of things back again. Um, and the other thing, I guess, is just not being able to see each other as much, because um, now there's only a handful of students in at a time instead of everyone there. And so we have to make sure that we talk to each other more in group meeting or to we have a brief um, Zoom social event with the lab that we do every couple of weeks um, to keep in touch. So it's mostly the scheduling is, is quite different. Yeah, I would say COVID's been bad for undergrads, I think, right? Yeah, because, it's really for undergrads. because since we can only have so many people working in lab, it's been really hard to, to have our undergrads. Um, so I think that's really sad. I hope that we're going to get out of this, at least move to a, the next phase soon. So I can vouch for that. Um, COVID hit right before my spring quarter. Um, so I ultimately, like, I guess you can say lost a quarter of research. And it was kind of like it was a moment of shock just because, you know, I had this timeline or a path that I kind of wanted to follow. And, you know, I scheduled in undergraduate research during my spring quarter. But with COVID, thankfully, um, the school is taking precautionary actions on approaching COVID. Um, so that's really good. Um, but it does put, I guess, a damper on things sometimes. But um, as long as everyone's safe, I feel like that's the best um, resolution that there is. Yeah, I think somebody uh, in the chat has transitioned. Oh, sorry. oh, I said somebody in the chat asked what you can do. And I guess, you know, you can potentially get involved in at least learning, like going to the lab meetings and maybe interacting with some of the students to kind of learn what the group is doing right now. And then maybe be ready to get into lab when, when things when that opens up. So I think you can start getting in a lab now, um, or at least start interacting with a lab. So, what do you think, Kyle? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I my lab has. Cool. Oh, my lab has shifted toward doing a lot of computational projects. So we've we've been um, trying to do a lot of theoretical calculations and preparing for the next round of experiments that we can do once the lab opens up a little bit more. Um, as far as my undergraduates, I, I only have a handful right now. Um, they are all either assisting grad students with their computational projects or are learning uh, programming skills so that they can um, contribute to some remote projects uh, while this is ongoing and hopefully be ready to contribute more in the lab. Oh, Christine's in the chat. Yeah, she's working on a, on a coding project right now uh, with me. Um, but yeah, it, it has been a really difficult time for undergraduates because um, in my lab, we, could, we only have one room and are allowed two people in that one room at a time. And so um, like we have to prioritize uh, the, um, we have to prioritize the grad students time right now. So we're trying as best we can to keep our undergrads involved, but it is very difficult with COVID right now. Um, I agree in terms of the impact. The impact was pretty large um, for us, uh, at least especially because we were about to get some of our animal studies started and cell culture. Uh, require several days to prepare. Um, and so it's been pretty impactful uh, for the grad students, but especially for the undergrads. Um, so it, I think I had eight undergrads coming in um, and then five of them graduated. And um, so I have three remaining. And uh, <clears throat> unlike Professor Crabtree, I don't actually know how to code. I'm learning. So the undergrads and I are actually learning how to code together and we're learning some evolutionary biology. So um, getting a little creative. They're working in some teams to try to actually do something different than what the grad students are doing, um, which also means that they had to bear with me learning with them and not really knowing what they're doing um, and having to learn from them, which is, is great, but it's definitely very different at the time um, than, you know, when they were doing uh, lab work. Um, and so a little bit for my lab, what that looks like is um, we're dabbling a little bit. We don't know how to do computational chemistry, nor do we know how to do computational biology, but we're learning. Yeah, and I just want to emphasize that this uh, question wasn't meant to discourage anyone from 
you know, exploring research topics or like reaching out to professors, still do those things, still show your interest in others' research. Just know that there's limitations to what can be done at the moment, just depending on the lab and circumstances. So I, can I just interject with that real quick, yeah. um, just to hop off of that. So just to give you an idea, at least I don't know what my, my colleagues are doing, but I, I kind of, I have a folder of emails from, from undergrads who are applying to labs and I'm basically holding on to them until we're in a better place to take them into the lab. So keep emailing um, and just hopping on that advice is that if someone doesn't email you back, just email them again. Um, or you can, you know, oh, I'm gonna, I don't wanna invite a whole bunch of emails, but I, I don't often respond the first time just because there's a lot of emails that come in. But if someone follows up, um, uh, I don't really mind. I'll be like, oh, they followed up, that's great. I completely forgot to respond to this email. So I, I you know, just keep that in mind um, that, not getting a response doesn't mean a no. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to add to this both, I'll, I'll ask, answer from my group and then from the URC perspective too, because we get these questions from all over campus. For my own group, yeah, it's not just the undergrads, the grad students. I mean, maybe because our work is so synthetic um, that, I mean, the graduate students have such li limited time in lab. So the graduate students are having a hard time in addition to the undergrads. And we've restricted access for most undergrads, except for one who's focusing on finishing experiments for a paper. Um, but as, as a result of that, I had all of the graduate students create a data set for data analysis. Basically, the students that would have gone in and done an NMR binding study or would have characterized a molecule that they synthesized, they were given data um, for which we kind of knew the answer, but they had to practice going through it and have that skill so that then when they did their own experiment, hopefully next quarter, they would already have gone through the process of analyzing and learning the critical thinking and data and software skills. And it's actually been really um, like successful so far because we often think of the importance of mixing chemicals and being in lab, which is only one of the small parts. You're also learning to communicate, ask questions, analyze data, think critically, um, search the literature, use software. And so that's been, I think, a really good outcome that we didn't do during the summer and we're finally doing now this quarter. Um, I did post a few uh, links in the chat from the Undergraduate Research Center perspective. We've been trying to answer these questions um, for a lot of people. Um, and you can get started with safety training. Um, there is a process you have to do that, but that's all online anyway. Um, you can do literature reviews and literature searching. There's also opportunities to learn coding, um, depending on what resources you're interested in. In my own group, in addition, to, we're trying to do some new modeling and docking, which is done in some of the undergraduate classes as well. So some of the undergrads actually have more experience in that than some of the graduate students in my group. Um, so there are opportunities, but also hopefully by next quarter, things are gonna be, you know, a little bit more back to normal. So anything you do now that you think of as preparing you for that will mean that when you're mixing those chemicals or running those assays or gels, you're gonna know more about what they mean and benefit from that. And my last plug was for jove.com. It's visualized research experiments. And so there are videos showing you techniques, showing you instrumentation. They have one for education as well as for um, research. And our university has a subscription. And every time students watch these, they're always um, excited to know that that's a resource that's available. And you should get better grades in your labs um, from the education videos too, because it just shows you really good examples of software and techniques for everything. All right, awesome. Uh, that's all we have for this question. I saw that uh, Dr. Byrne was also answering questions in the chat, so do keep an eye on the chat. Uh, so I know earlier we briefly mentioned emailing professors. So as a follow-up to that, how can students reach out to professors or labs to get involved with their research? And I guess I'll pick on Dr. David this time. <laughs> I mean, a lot of students email, but just like Marie was saying, Dr. Heffern was saying that's, you know, sometimes we don't respond right away because we get so many emails or we just forget um, or we think we'll respond later or we're going to ask a grad student. Um, so I would just follow up on the emailing. Um, recently, a lot of my undergrads have come through my grad students, um, which is kind of an interesting route because, um, you know, they might have had that student um, in w when they were TAing, they might have had that student um, as in their lab that they were TAing, and so they had um, so that you know so that's another route too is to talk to some of your TAs 
and find out about what labs they're in. Um, and again, you know, there is the whole campus, so you really should look, um, you know, broadly. Um, I actually, because of, this might happen to Marie too, um, because we're on this biology interface, I, I get a lot of emails from students who are not chemistry students. Um, but, you know, I actually tend to favor the chemistry undergrads because I just feel that biology undergrads, there's so many labs for them. Um, and, you know, but I do get like so many, because of what we do, we get, you know, I get so many students from the whole campus. Um, emailing. So you just have to be persistent, I think. Sometimes it's, you know, when we're not in COVID anymore, go to somebody's office and just <laughs> poke your head in. <laughs> All right. Is there anything that the other professors would like to add on to that or did that cover pretty much everything? There will be a workshop later this week as part of the undergraduate research week events about how to write an email email to a faculty member and kind of guide you through that process and make sure you know how to think about what to look up, what to say, make your best first impression. And that's good practice because you're writing it as a professional communication and not just a, hey, do you have spots in your lab? Can I come to your group meeting? Thanks. All right, you want to add a little more information than that. Yeah. That's definitely very true. You should show like a genuine interest in the lab, you know, maybe look at some of the papers they did. There's, you know, just don't do a copy paste to a bunch of professors that it's just not very personal and probably won't be received very well. But yes, yeah, so there was a lot of great advice about emailing and definitely do check out the workshop if you're interested in reaching out to people for their research. Um, also on the topic of joining a lab. Would you say your lab has any sort of prerequisites for joining as far as any class requirements or GPA requirements and I will ask Dr. Crabtree to start answering, please. Sure. Um, sorry if it gets a little crazy in the background. My dogs are sprinting around the house at the moment. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't have any hard prerequisites um, because as a physical chemistry lab, most chemistry majors don't take PCHEM until their junior or senior year. And there's enough of a learning curve in my lab that it takes maybe a year or so to for an undergraduate to kind of get their feet under them and start being productive. So if I waited until everybody had taken physical chemistry, then you know nobody would have a very good experience. And when I started my own graduate studies, like I had a very weak PCHEM background. Uh, so I, I wasn't really well prepared academically. So I, I, like for me, what I'm looking for in a student is someone who is uh, willing to learn new skills, willing to just dive in and uh, be ready to take on anything, not just stuff that they have encountered in their chemistry classes, but maybe they need to learn some mechanical design and drafting or, or learn how to design electronic circuits. Um, I'm sure Kelly can uh, add a little bit more on what she's seen from our undergraduate. Yeah, to piggyback off of that, um, he even for the grad students entering a PCHEM lab, the learning curve is very steep. Um, so it's it's even more so for an undergraduate. So getting an undergrad, you know, as early as a sophomore is really great because usually, I mean, at least time I've been here, our undergrads persist. They they stay all the way because it takes a lot of time. Um, we're you know they're in, investing in the lab and we're investing in them to learn so many different new skills, um, like Kyle said, building to coding to theoretical um, and you know finally spectroscopy, which is our ultimate goal. But everything kind of has to build up to that. So that's kind of, that's our perspective. Uh, I'm sure um, other faculty have very different perspectives on on how quickly that undergraduate can kind of onboard and get going and, and start doing experiments. So I think you'll just notice when you start doing your research on what different on different types of labs, um, you know, email the, the grad students more often they will probably email you back <laughs> much quicker um, than the faculty member. You'll learn very quickly the huge variety of um, what how long it'll take for you to kind of get going, so to speak. So um, definitely talk to talk to the grad students. It's like we are very, we will 
talk your ear off as far as um uh you know what goes on um behind the scenes so uh so definitely encourage you to do that um i'd like to i guess add on to that um and and this is coming from i guess a a student perspective that just graduated um as um uh, i guess dr cabtree and um kelly said that it's really important to stay open-minded, um, especially when it comes to undergraduate research. And I feel like uh, a lot of professors seek out a lot of people that you know want to learn, want to gain skills, want to expand themselves um, outside of the classroom setting. And I think that's um, important. That's like an important skill set to have, not only in your undergraduate career but also in your future professional career as well um, being able to you know have that optimism and persistence to challenge yourself um, I guess would be a, a quote-unquote prerequisite um, because uh, whether or not like um, it's you join like no matter where you join um, in a research lab, in a biology lab, chemistry lab, you're gonna seek out so many different opportunities to learn. And I think that's important to keep in mind, um, especially as an undergrad. Um, this is the best time to just get as much information as you can, become a sponge, use every opportunity to you know, learn and adapt yourself and, you know, I guess expand on what you think you already like. Sometimes you'll discover things that you might have not thought of. So I think that's my, I guess, prerequisite that I've noticed a lot of professors kind of enjoy or would, um, I guess, seek out. Yeah, I would say my lab doesn't have specific prerequisites, but I, um, Organic chemistry is really useful um, for synthesis, but it's not a prerequisite. Um, I do find it sometimes, in the beginning, there's just a lot to learn. So sometimes I prefer it if you want to join really early, maybe work, wait until winter or spring of your freshman year, because um, there's just too much going on in the beginning. And then I have found that another common time that I start to get emails it's kind of from juniors. Um, I'm not sure why that is, um, but they usually, they join by the winter of their junior year. They kind of just have enough time to learn everything and start to do something before they graduate. Um, there is the big learning curve, whether you're working on synthesis or electrochemistry um, in my lab. Um, so it's good to start early. Yeah, so sort of to wrap up that question, it seems like the general consensus is sometimes it's good to have certain classes already under your belt. It can help you a lot with the learning curve of the lab, but don't let that stop you from reaching out to professors earlier on. And sort of piggybacking off of what Dr. Bourbon said. Well, somewhat piggybacking. Uh, how late would you say is too late to join a research lab? And is, it, is there a point where it's too late? And I'm going to ask Dr. Franz to answer, please. Um, it's never too late because even in one quarter, you can learn a lot. But I think most faculty um, do encourage students to make sure to try to get involved with, well, if you had three quarters, you know, that gives you, or two quarters in the summer or one quarter in the summer, that kind of gives you a nice opportunity to have enough information to present at the group meetings at a local conference or even a national conference and the longer you stay the more you build your own confidence and skills and have opportunities to publish and present um, so I know some students though will even if it's your spring quarter they'll sometimes stay for the summer afterward you can be you can volunteer or be paid to continue research during that time so there are opportunities, but we do encourage students to try not to wait to the very last quarter because it is a lot harder at that point because students are often thinking about what they're going to do after graduation. So I think following with what some other people said, you know, sophomore, junior year is a nice time. 
Um, and also there's just the possibility that if you join something in your sophomore year and realize it's not the best you know, research area, you get some skills, but you might then fine tune that and shift to another area that gives you more of the focus that you wanna follow up on for grad school or industry. And, and you guys should all look into these summer programs, like these REU programs, because there's, you don't, you know, there are a lot of programs that you can go do research not at Davis, and a lot of those they actually you get paid. <laughs> so, um, so look into those too. And I'll use that to emphasize: we do have several, and we have an NSF funded program. We have a College of Letters and Science (MERPS) program. So we do have programs here that also provide stipends for students who have financial aid or are first generation students. Um, we also have the Innovation Institute for Food and Health. Um, that one is not dependent on financial aid status, but is very dependent on the type of research that you're focusing on related to food and health. So there are lots of different research programs that do provide funding. You can also register for credit so that you can you know, consider it being paid in terms of your units or your grades. 194H is a letter grade um, honors thesis. So there are ways to be compensated and recognized in addition to awards and prizes that you can get for communicating, publishing, and presenting your research. I just mentioned one other program. My lab participates in military and veteran students. You can get paid quite nicely over the summer and during the semester for research. All right, thank you so much. Uh, since it's now around six o'clock, we're gonna switch over to answering some of the audience questions. So I know um, the professors and our panelists have been keeping an eye and answering some of your questions in the chat. Uh, I believe Rima has also been keeping track of some of the more common questions. Was there anything that you saw that should be answered during this panel, Rima? Yeah, so um, actually most of the questions um, we're mainly asking how can I get involved in research uh, because of COVID and I think we covered that um, mainly um, but there are some questions um, that a single student asked about um, uh, so how do students look and ask for undergrad research opportunity um, and how does uh, there was another one um, if certain classes are recommended to take before a lab, does actual lab experience matter um, as well? With COVID, the lab portions of courses have been online. Okay, so like distinguishing whether physical wet lab experience is necessary mm -hmm. when they have like virtual lab experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna ask Dr. Heffern, and what's your take on that? Would you say that virtual lab sort of works all right for wet lab experience? Um, so I, I mean, this kind of goes along with the prerequisite question, um, whether certain experiences are required. I don't think it's required um, to join a research lab. I, you know, the stuff that we do in my lab, um, we, the assumption I make is that the student has no experience with it and we teach under that assumption, because especially for certain things like synthesis, um, I wanna assume that even safety protocols that we're learning from the ground up, because I don't ever wanna assume that a student knows something and then find out they don't. Um, same thing with cell culture, when we don't want our cells to get contaminated, I just assume that we're teaching everything from the beginning. And I do this with grad students as well. So I think, I'm not gonna say that it, it's, um, it has no effect. I think having only virtual labs can be harder, um, but that just means that if you get into a lab, then you might just have to put in the extra time to get used to and develop your, your skills, um, you know, good hands for the lab and things like that. Um, but that's for a lab that does experimental lab work. It could be very different for a lab. Let's say someone joins my lab and wants to work on some of this evolutionary biology projects. You know, the virtual labs are probably just, I, I think you can use a keyboard and a mouse just fine, right? So I think it just depends on the project that you would start on. All right, thank you so much for answering that. I saw a few questions go by in the chat. Um, one of them was tips for freshmen interested in joining labs. Uh, I'd say you could start off at the UC Davis Chemistry website. We have a list of all of our faculty and links to all of their labs there. 
So you can check out their lab websites and some of their publications and some of the work they're doing, as well as see who is in that lab. So maybe a point of contact for a graduate student or reaching out to the professor. Uh, but is there any other way that you would like students to reach out to you sort of with this virtual setup? I think it was mentioned earlier, but definitely contacting graduate students. Um, you can always contact faculty, but if you have a TA and you go to the office hours, um, I also mentioned earlier the opportunity to do informational interviews. Um, but once you've kind of interviewed or talked to the graduate student, you can ask them about coming to a research group meeting or a subgroup meeting. And I think that's a great option. And then the same thing with faculty. Um, so um, just approaching them, and I know there was a discussion, um, Marie and I were both talking about whether to, you, yes or no to email more than once. I sometimes miss the email the first time it comes through. I know some colleagues um, don't respond unless a second email comes through because sometimes people do a, a multiple email to multiple faculties and they wait. Um, so it's okay. Oh, Annalisa, sorry, my no was in agreement with you because I, oh. I think the question was if it looks bad. And I oh, said, okay, no. does it look bad? Okay, great. I thought it you said no, don't. Okay. No, yeah, it doesn't that, look bad at all. Every time I get a second email, I was like, oh, right, I was supposed to um, to answer that email. <laughs> yeah. But sometimes if your first email was just like, hey, do you have a position? Thanks. You're probably, I'm not, never going to respond to those. You need to introduce yourself, say what year you are, what major you are. Um, but then definitely feel free to send a second email. Partly right now, faculty are human. We've got so much going on. It's, if it's depending on what day it is, we might miss the email, depending on how many other emails came in. And sometimes students, um, email several faculty members and if they send a second email then you know they're actually interested as opposed to when I email a student back and they're like oh I already got a position and I was like it's only been 48 hours <laughs> like um, yeah so feel free to email faculty more than once in addition to contacting graduate students all right thanks so much uh, there's another question from Emily this one might be a little more directed towards Kelly but uh, she said she's looking at grad school are there certain fields of research that are recommended more than others, or do graduate schools just want to see research experience regardless of the field? I think many faculty here are probably on acceptance on the recruitment committees, so they would know more about um, what happens in those meetings. But as a grad student, um, like in, during my application process, I should say, I knew I needed research experience. First of all, I needed experience to know if I wanted to keep going and, and be a, a graduate student researcher. Um, but also, yeah, the, the applications really, as far as I'm concerned, they really want to know if you had experience researching, like a, just that blanket statement. So if I wanted to go into chemistry, at least in our department, um, you know, I, let's say I, I was really interested in inorganic and I got accepted, you're not married to that. Um, you, you know, that first year you're doing rotations, you're talking to other uh, faculty members, you're getting experience kind of in different fields. Um, so they're really interested in just knowing if you've gone through the experience of doing research, whether it's whatever track that was, because you, you do have the freedom to change your mind <laughs> later um, and decide, actually, I want to go, you know, and do this type of research. So I don't know how rigid other campuses could be. I, I don't know. I can't speak to that. Um, but, you know, when you're doing that application in December of your senior year for that next year and you're like, oh, my gosh, I have to check this box as far as, you know, what path I'm going to you know, put down. Just know that you can always change your mind. Right. You're, you're, but if you've had experience doing research and you know what that feels like, you've presented, you've done lit researches, um, you've worked in, in collaboration with grad students or other undergraduates, you've created, you know, schedule for yourself you show up you do the work like all of these other skills that you never actually potentially put in like your application if you're doing that right and you're and you can say that you've had experience that's what i think they're looking for so uh, I, I hope i'm answering the question as far as from my perspective but um as far as people you know in this panel who've actually accepted you i think they might be able to actually comment more about that I'll add to that, uh, Kelly. Um, so a big thing that um, can also make a difference, and it sounds like it's not going to be in your control, but in many ways it is, is your recommendation letters. Um, and uh, experience with a professor that goes beyond your classes can make a much stronger recommendation letter, provided that it's a positive experience, um, than just a professor that taught your class. 
And so in that sense, with any graduate program, um, you know, I, I, with students who are applying to pharmacy school, um, if you have volunteer experience as a pharmacy tech, um, your boss or your manager can speak um, very much so beyond what your transcript can show. Um, and it's the same way with, in terms of why it is, you know, for grad school, any, any research, we're just saying any research will, will be acceptable. Um, it just gives you more to your application than what your transcript and your grades would show. Um, so that's, uh, I think there are some exceptions, like depends on the program. Um, and I would say that if there's a graduate program that you're interested in, some of them might have prerequisites for classes. Like I know UCSF's chemical biology program expects like a certain number of years for classes. But um, aside from that, on the research side, I haven't, maybe others have seen more prerequisite or research fields, but I haven't seen anything really like that. Yeah, I think it depends on how high you're, you're aiming, I guess. I mean, I think if you are aiming to go to grad school at UCSF, then the name recognition of the faculty member that you're working for does make a difference. But um, that you know they know that the letter is from somebody that they know. But uh, but but I think for most graduate programs, like you know um, that that just any research is good, and um, and having the letter that actually makes it clear that the person actually knows you is is uh, is really useful. All right, thank you for answering that question. <laughs> yeah. uh, I saw one sort of go past uh, that Dr. Bourbon had answered, but there was a question about whether or not there was sort of like on the job training or any sort of training after you enter a lab. So what sort of the experience after you've entered the lab? And I guess Ellen, you'll have some experience in how it started for you. Oh, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, uh, to, I guess, answer your question, um, undergraduate research, um, I guess you can say, well, how should I explain this? Can I have you repeat the question so that I can phrase my um, answer a little bit better? Yeah, so just generally, what was your experience after you joined the lab? Like, what were sort of the steps after you had done all the emailing and you got accepted? Um, so my, the process in which I kind of, I guess, sought out to do undergraduate research, um, I came into Professor Shayla David's lab um, not really knowing much uh, besides like, you know, I've done uh, chemical synthesis in a gen chem and that's where you do like basic titrations and everything. Um, I didn't have experience of synthesizing my own compounds or running columns or operating HPLCs. I, um, I guess once I got through the whole emails um, and I met up with the team members, I got the opportunity to get trained. Um, and as Professor Shayla David mentioned in the chat that um, you get trained on the job and you learn by doing and that's the best way for anyone to kind of, I guess, gain experience. Um, and if anyone's like intimidated, like, do I need to know how to, I guess, um, perform chemical synthesis or uh, know how to do physical chemistry beforehand? Uh, that's truly like not really true. Like that's not something that you are required. Um, it's good to have that theoretical knowledge, um, but if you're intimidated by the experience, um, that shouldn't hold you back from pursuing undergraduate research. And um, I guess, in a sense, um, un, I guess faculty members um, and lab members are always willing to teach you. Um, and it's important to just seek out those opportunities. Um, whenever I had the chance, I kind of asked um, people around the lab whether or not I can like, potentially shadow them and you know branch out of my skill sets. So I guess it was a smooth sailing um, after you know you get in um, and don't be afraid to I guess try out different labs um, ask the shadow if you're on the fence about joining a lab once you make um, I guess the cut or something um, there's always that opportunity to oh I want to shadow your lab 
for a couple days. See how that goes. If you don't like it, then um, you can always move on to the next um, or stay open minded and maybe it'll um, grow on you in the future. All right, thank you so much for answering that. Um, I'm seeing some more questions about when to reach out to faculty. I know there's been a lot of answering from Dr. Franz and from Dr. Heffern, but just to, you know, put it out here verbally, what would you say is the best time or is there a good or bad time to start reaching out about research? Um, so I kind of, I guess, wanted to get into research as soon as possible, just because I know this was a research institute um, and I just wanted to, you know, participate in research. Um, and initially I emailed professors and um, I kind of jumped around here and there where I just wanted to see like, oh, I got into this research lab and that was my only offer at the time. So I kind of, you know, did a sh like a bit of shadowing in a sense, but it ended up not being um, in, in a field that I was particularly interested in. Um, and I got into Professor Shayla David's lab, I believe my summer of my, I guess, junior year. So the year before I joined, I was a junior or my third year. Um, so that, I guess you can say that would be quote unquote late in the game, but um, there's, it's never too late to join research. Um, I, even though I joined, you know, two years later than other people that you know, during their freshman year, I still use that opportunity to um, the best of my abilities. So I guess um, try early, but don't get discouraged if, you know, your the timeline doesn't work out because there's never a too late of an option. Yeah, when it, I think whenever you're ready to to commit the time, then, you know, then try to to do it you don't want to do it and then not be really able to 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 put your put you know your your yourself not be able to put your best foot forward so you know think about like when you really have the time and when you're going to be able to um you know really get involved because that you know joining up in a lab and then not showing up is not a good good situation either right so you want to um yeah you want to make sure that when you that you're ready to make a commitment and do do your best but you know most faculty are pretty understanding we know you guys are students and that you have classes and sometimes I always tell my undergrads that I understand that they have other things going on and that sometimes like they just get flipped out and they have to put their classes first but the most important thing is communication and uh, communicating with me and the grad students so that the grad students aren't wasting their time you know waiting for you to show up and then you don't show up or you know, or expecting that you're going to do something and you don't do it. Um, so, you know, as long as there's communication that, hey, I'm going to have a bunch of midterms next week. So I think I might work harder this week and not work very much next week. So anyway, so I think, uh, yeah, part of it is like looking at yourself and thinking about, you know, if you really can do it and when you can really, you know, what works for you. So I don't think there's necessarily a good or bad time. Um, yeah, so just sort of uh, piggybacking off of that, uh, on the topic of having the time to do something, generally, what would you say you need to commit towards lab, like on a weekly basis? Is it 10 to 12 hours? Is it more or less than that for your lab? And I'm going to direct this towards Dr. Crabtree. Yeah, um, it's, uh, it's hard to put real numbers on this because like, usually with undergraduate research, you're going to get out of the experience what you put into it. And so if you only are putting in a couple hours a week, you're not going to gain very many skills, you're not gonna make a lot of progress, and it's probably not going to be uh, worth your time. Uh, I saw that um, in the chat, Professor Franz was recommending um, somewhere between like eight and 20 hours a week. Um, I, and like if you can do that, then that is great. I think a lot of labs, you know, you're gonna have you're gonna have trouble really getting something done if you're not willing to commit, you know, at least that kind of chunk of a time. I guess if you figure that one unit of research is a, a commitment of at least three hours, um, 
like that's probably really on the lower end of doing something. If you took one research unit and tried to do three hours a week, it's really hard to get a lot um, accomplished. All right, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions in the chat? If you like, at this point, you guys can unmute yourself to ask the questions. I'm looking at the chat and it seems like um, most of the questions were answered. Uh, there's a question from Saraya. How many units of research is then required or recommended per quarter? I want to say just in terms of the hours and also this type of question of how many units, it's really great to talk to the faculty member because different research and different faculty have different expectations. And it also depends like your first quarter when you're still learning and getting trained versus your second, third, or even your fifth quarter. At some point, some of the undergrads are more advanced than the graduate students and they're in lab just as much because they've adjusted their schedule, you know, they're a first author on a publication or something that changes their approach. Um, so these are really great conversations to have. Um, and I know in my own lab, I have some students that I know in advance don't have the same time commitment available and I can design projects for them appropriately where I know other students want to do a senior thesis or an honors thesis or it's their second year and then we make sure to design that project. So, and it can also change like one quarter, you might have a lot of time and another quarter, then you might have a heavier course load. So you just want to have good communication with the faculty advisor and know that it's definitely not a one size fits all. There's lots of flexibility. We know that your students first and that this is not to replace your classes, but to complement and expand your expertise and experience that you have here. Um, so I think there's not really a perfect answer, but just to have that conversation so that there's a clear level of communication with different faculty. Okay, thank you so much. Um, this is a question we didn't get a chance to hit on earlier, but there was mention of publications during some of the conversations. How realistic is it for an undergraduate researcher to get their name on a publication? Uh, it's very realistic. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of times, I think a lot of us, what we do is we pair our, um, an undergraduate with a grad student. And a lot of the grad students are actually quite excited to have an undergraduate working with them. Um, sounds like uh, Ellen was doing a lot of HPLC probably for his, the grad student that she was working with. Uh, you know, because they're like, yay, we can get, you know, I've got all these all the pieces of DNA that I need to purify. And so I can get my undergrad to get on the HPLC and do it. Um, so, but you know, a lot of times if the undergrad makes a real contribution to the project, they, they get their name on the paper, so. But sometimes there is a bit of luck involved. <laughs> so. I think it really, it truly depends on the, the lab and the timeline of the experiments. Um, it, you know, experiments can be years long or they can be decades long. No, I'm kidding. Um, you know, they, they can just be quite long. So, and it, the, like she said, the timing of the, the undergrad kind of getting involved in the project um, is also huge. So, um, it, it really can just completely depend on, on really the lab itself. So, in our lab, things happen very slowly. So we have to be very patient for things to occur. And you also have these unforeseen problems of things that break or experiments that truly don't, they're not gonna work in the time period that you're, you're trying to get things going. But I have also um, seen people graduate and then a few years later, their pro what they were working on eventually kind of got finished, so to speak. So they were, you know, involved in an REU project that got published a few years later. So it doesn't all necessarily happen while you were as an undergraduate researcher in that lab. It might happen later on because you're never going to not, you know, talk to the people you were working with because that networking is, is really start strong and is established. So later on, you might still contribute or get that name on the paper, uh, et cetera. 
All right, thank you for that. Um, we're hitting the last four minutes or so of this panel. Do we have any other sort of last minute questions to wrap things up? So Ellen, where did you get a job? <laughs> you didn't tell me. <laughs> Um, I, I thought, I, I thought Cindy told you, but I haven't really, I guess, told a lot of people just because, um, I never, I didn't want to jinx it. Um, but I actually, so initially I got a job, um, through, it's like a COVID testing, uh, I guess, company where they get the samples and then we process them and we get the results and we give them to the people. So that was a good, I guess, intro job. But now I'm working at Vaxite. Um, that's in Foster City where I work um, on protein purification. Um, oh. Yeah. And so um, it's an interesting experience just because it's um, for vex it's like a company that makes vaccines for like infectious diseases so i'm working on the group a strep project um so it's really really cool and i am really thankful just because um i am able to apply a lot of the knowledge i gained from undergrad research to my i guess career now my job just because um when we're using um the HPLC, I'm able to like apply column chromatography to the process um, and just try understand everything theoretically. And then so that makes my job a lot easier when I'm explaining about like what I'm doing um, during my presentations and stuff. That's cool. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So since we only have a few more minutes left, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for everyone who showed up and came and asked questions. And thank you to all of our panelists for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, definitely check out the Undergraduate Research Center and some of the other events that they're holding. Also check out uh, the chemistry department itself and what the advising department is planning. Uh, hopefully you guys are getting emails from Perry and you got one this morning as an additional reminder to come to this meeting. We have two more research panels coming up this week. There's one tomorrow from 4 to 10 to 5.30, and that's going to be undergraduate researchers only. So they're going to be able to talk to you about their personal experience reaching out to labs and what they've done. So definitely check them out. And there's going to be another faculty and graduate student panel on Thursday at this exact time, uh, 5.10 to 6.30. So that's going to be with a different panel of faculty members. So they might give you different answers to questions we went over today. And they're also going to go over other questions that we didn't cover today. So also check out that panel if you have the time. But again, thank you so much for coming. And thank you again to our panelists for speaking to us. It was a lot of fun. I hope everyone here learned a lot. Uh, and yeah, that'll conclude this meeting. Okay, thanks. <laughs>